Yeah, because I'm getting a lot of weird, like, yeah, reverb. It, mm -hmm. It's been increasing. So let's just try that and see if... And not really. Oh, it was a nice experiment, but anyway. by in order to survive a writer's round table. Number one, you can never have sense. Sense equals debt, okay? Sense leads to writer's block and that means artistic death. Number two, you must drink and or do drugs. It's an extension of number one. Worked for Stephen King, right? And number three, never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back, because you won't be back. Figure out your internet issues. See, you break the rules, and the rules break you. Welcome back to Visited by Voices. Uh, we're not quite live once again for our second Writer's Roundtable. Uh, I am joined today by Kevin Lucia, Gwendolyn Keist. <laughs> you were worried I was going to do it again, I know. <laughs> Kristen Cleveland. Hello. Steve Rasnick Tim. Hello. Nancy Kilpatrick. And the right on time, Armand Rosamalia. Barely, but I'm here. Jersey time. I, 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 I had faith. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming on tonight. It really, um, it's a thrill for me to get people together who are, are working on the literary side of horror to have these discussions. I think they're important. The first uh, volume of these Writer Roundtables was extremely well received, um, and I have no intention of slowing down. I just wanted to start with just a freeform collect. This is just a conversation. It's not an interview with any one person, so feel free to talk over each other and make noise, uh, scream, yell, just as long as we're civil in, in the most disobedient way possible, I'm happy. But I wanted to talk about the horror genre's reputation to start with. It's always been a step under mainstream, although there are certain writers who have worked in the mainstream in horror. In general, it's always been kind of a, a slight bit ghettoized of a genre. First off, I just wanted to ask, is that even a negative? Or maybe that's where this genre should operate. What do you guys think? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Bueller? Uh, I'll just say that generally I think it's kind of irrelevant to those. I always think of it as sort of like heavy metal, you know, horror is mm -hmm. heavy metal in the music mm -hmm. world, which is a, an interesting aspect, you know, of music, but it's mm -hmm. definitely a niche. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, it hasn't had played a big role for you? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I do come from a an academic background. I come from a master's in creative writing program. Mm -hmm. So at least for the people I graduated with, uh, they I suppose they did look a bit askance at the direction I took with my career. But uh, the people I've been in contact with from that program, they still like my fiction. It's the same kind of fiction I was writing mm -hmm. when I was in the graduate program, just back mm -hmm. then they called it uh, surrealism or magical realism. They just didn't uh -huh. use the word horror. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't hear Steve. Mm -hmm. I guess there's always going to be one person you can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was brilliant, but. <laughs> it, it, it was. We'll, we'll catch you back up on it I'll, later. I'll be, I'll yeah, I, I'm rewatching and be like, I had the perfect thing to say to him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have someone sign it out to you. It'll be good. 
Uh, For me, I had a kind of different, like, upbringing. Like, both my parents are huge, huge horror fans. So I never really saw it as being weird. I think that kind of, I became aware of that as I got older. But growing up, like, my my mom loved Ray Bradbury. My dad loved Poe. We watched Hammer movies and Twilight Zone. And that was, like, my parents got married on Halloween back in the early 80s. And so it was, like, this was just always part of, like, my life. So I think it was as time went on, it was, like, Oh, so other people feel like this is like, you know, bad or below. So it's like a kind of different way of approaching it because it's just like horror is always, I always say horror is where the heart is for me. So it's kind of like very, a different way of, of thinking about it, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> Kristen had a very similar upbringing. No, not at all. Go ahead. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no, I was actually raised um, in very strict, uh, like evangelical household. Um, oh dear. So, yes, which uh, I, I feel no longer. You. I feel you. I feel do you? you. Okay, okay. You yeah, can do it. I, I like to refer to myself as a recovered Baptist. So okay, I'm oh, a re yes. I'm a recovering Baptist. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a special kind of pain um, <laughs> that we go through. <laughs> but when I was growing up, it was no like I wasn't even allowed to watch Smurfs because there was a wizard. Like there was no witches, anything. Of course, anything like like. I, I was actually taught that you could get possessed. Like that was something that, you know, just might happen to you if you weren't careful enough. So I spent a lot of <laughs> my formative years, like really uh, worried about, you know, encountering the devil. But I was always very intrigued by horror and by things that I, that I felt were like taboo or transgressive. And, and by the weird, just the weird and the uncanny was always things I was really interested in. So when I got old enough that I could start, um, you know, getting more things on my own, I started reading like Stephen King and, you know, um, John Saul and like the kind of like the horror blockbusters that were available at the time. And then as I went on, I just got more and more crazy. And now I'm, you know, writing stories about a woman who, you know, gives birth to death incarnate. So I've come, you know, I feel like I've come a long way. <laughs> Free covered. <laughs> <laughs> but it was always something that I felt was like all this knowledge and all this potential and possibility. I was always so interested in that. So, you know, as I got older, you know, I was able to explore those things more. And my my mom is not nearly as strict anymore. Some of the stuff that I'm into, she, she'll kind of, that I write or whatever, she'll kind of be like, okay, okay, that's that sounds good. I might, I might skip that one, but, you know, that sounds good for you. Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> that's right. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Armand, what do you say? You know, for me, it was great because I grew up with my mother. I mean, still to this day, is a huge horror fan, and mm -hmm. so I I grew up on Dean Koontz, and uh, I guess my rebelliousness was she's a, still a huge Stephen King fan. So I started reading all the Dean Koontz books she had, <laughs> and like you know, anything with a giant spider on it, anything that was creepy, and uh, and she would always encouraged me obviously to read she would always give me those books we would i remember going to the flea market when when we were little and me and my mom would go they had a used books book stall and we would literally go together and i'm like 12 and 13 years old and she's like okay let's pick some books and we would grab all we would grab a bunch of used books and then she would read them first she'd cross out all the dirty parts and then she'd give them <laughs> to me to read so you know the violence wasn't bad but i grew up in new jersey so you know I mean, the profanity was, was part of, you know, growing up. That was no big deal. I, I could read an F word. I just couldn't read about them having sex uh, right. while while doing it. So, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it was a hundred percent encouragement. Um, you know, as a kid and you write really cheesy things and my mother was always very supportive and always kind of bred it and nodded her head. Oh, that's really good. You know, keep going and kind of thing. So uh, it was always really supportive. I mean, to this day, I'll give her, um, I'll give her one of a copy of every one of my books, but I'll always say, "Don't read this one, or <laughs> these. These are good. Read these, you know, because uh, you know it's it's funny. It's kind of we've we've gone opposite now. I'm like, you can't read these. There's a lot of sex in these books. I don't want my mom reading about <laughs> me writing about sex, you know. So. <laughs> that is a great story. I love the idea that it came full circle from your mom. Yeah. You're like, you can't read about sex. Now you're like, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. I love that story. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, how do you see this? 
Well, so um, I had a similar, I, I grew up during the satanic panic uh, during the 80s mm -hmm. and the 90s. Um, so I didn't really get it from my parents too much. Um, I got it from my church community, though. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. These things were all evil, sinful. If you watch a horror movie, you're going to be possessed and things like that. So I didn't really get it from my parents, but I was definitely in that um, that same uh, culture. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think I was attracted to horror before I knew I was attracted to horror. So I always told myself I like comic books and science fiction and things like that. But looking back, it was always weird stuff. You know, like the scary stories or, you know, the uh, cartoons just had like weird monsters in it and things like that. <laughs> um, but I initially liked, liked science fiction. Um, you know, the first couple of stories I tried to write were like Star Wars knockoffs or Isaac Asimov knockoffs and things like that, you know. So... Um, and I was drawn to the horror genre probably in my mid to late twenties. Ironically enough, I went through kind of a bad patch in my life and, and science fiction wasn't really answering the questions that I had about life anymore. You know, mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. you know, and also too, again, my parents never told me you can't watch horror, but that kind of got built. Like the only thing I knew of Stephen King growing up was that, uh, American Express card commercial of him and the front of the spooky castle. And I'm like, oh, Stephen King, but I remember picking up my first Stephen King novel when I was like 25, 26, and it was Desperation. And for me, I, I was blown away because, okay, here's all the gore and the sex that they expected it to be, but Desperation is very much a book about faith and evil, and you know, so for me, that, that really spoke to me. Um, as far as it is now, I'm still definitely the black sheep in the mostly moderate uh, evangelical family i did I, they, they still look at me like you write those stories and like, yes i do so um but it's funny because i always hear people all the time armand it's funny that you uh talk about dean coons because i always hear people like oh i hate horror but i love dean coons and i'm just like really or even better i don't read that horror but i like stephen king and i'm like how, how does that work so i don't know what, how that speaks there lauren about that that public perception yeah. of what horror is you know? yeah yeah well you find that a lot a lot of people protest that they don't read that stuff and then you talk to them for five minutes and they list off 10 titles that they've read in the last 10 years in yeah, the genre things is their favorite show or something like exactly. that exactly you know? yeah. i mean i i grew up very rural in new jersey um so we didn't have access to you know niceties like record stores or bookstores we had department stores and that's how you survived uh, but there was the there was the bookmobile that came to the school one day every year. And in 1977, when I was still just a pup or a kitten, depending on how you want to look at it, I found this at the bookmobile. And uh, look, there's actually, I think, like seven year old Lauren signing her <laughs> inside the book. So I love it. This, you know, lust. Black and white illustration, illustrated, yeah. incredibly simple oh. overview of or movies was the first thing. It was the thing that hit me between the eyes and said, "You love this stuff." And I don't know why I was drawn to it in the bookmobile because the bookmobile, if you never had a bookmobile, it was just a panel truck that opened up and there was books in it. Mm -hmm. And you know, my mom probably scrounged together two dollars and gave it to me, and I got two books. But I mean, after that, it was yard sales, right? And mm -hmm. so. A book called *The Glow* um, and uh, Stephen King's *Night Shift*, and most importantly, though, more important than the others, *Shadows* too. Um, and Charles L. Grant is probably the oh, most my. instrumental figure for me, because as an editor, he pulled the universe together. He was the unifying force for me for so many years. A, a new *Shadows* book would come out, and you knew you were getting a cross section of his a yearbook as it were, for that year. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I discovered all of those anthologies very late. But once I once I discovered them, it was just kind of like, you know, I, I think I had the same. Again, I discovered horror very late, but uh, um, I, for a long time there, I just read Stephen King, Dean Koontz, and Peter Straub, which are fine, fine writers. But um, I had an opportunity to hang out one night with uh, Paul Wilson, Tom Montelone, and Stuart Schiff. And they were talking about all these writers, and I'm like, my head was kind of spinning. So I just went out and started buying the Whispers anthologies, the Shadows anthologies, every Charles Grant book I could find. And I discovered them later than you, 
but those books were very, very important. Because at that time, I was writing horror, like very obvious, ooh, there's a monster in this, or ooh, this was about a werewolf. But until I discovered a lot of those books, I don't think I really started developing my own voice. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. was Shadows Anthologies. Shadows, mm -hmm. the Whispers Anthologies, and uh, mm -hmm. Carl Edward Wagner's uh, best yeah, horror best. stories. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. I think we're seeing uh, some generational and uh, geographical differences here because when I was a kid, there really was no horror genre per se. Right. There was Poe, and mm -hmm. there was Washington Ir Irving and Nathaniel Hawthorne, mm -hmm. and writers like there, those. Uh, my grandfather in his in his library there was a volume of British ghost stories mm -hmm. along with mm -hmm. some folklore. I mm -hmm. really didn't associate those with horror. Mm -hmm. So there was also no public library where I came from. Oh, wow. It wasn't a public oh, library wow. until I was at, well into high school. So when I started writing horror fiction, my parents really didn't know what that was. They didn't really read much anyway. So mm -hmm. that was an advantage in some ways since I could write fairly personal stories mm -hmm. and know that they would never read them. <laughs> I do like bringing up how much libraries can be such a part of, of, of you know, authors and, and just being a reader because, like, it's so sad that you didn't have a library for so long. So I remember, like, we have the town where I grew up, I, even when I complain about my hometown, I never complain about the library. The library is like something out of a movie. It, it's not huge, but it's pretty good size, especially for a small town. And I just, I feel like I grew up there. Like my mom was so proud of me. I was like two and a half, three, you know, signing my own name to get my own library card. And everybody was like all the librarians were like, I can't believe she can actually like sign her own name. I was so little. And also I just want to say about the bookmobile. I always wanted a bookmobile, but we actually had a library library at the school so my mom had to explain to me like no you guys have a library those are for kids that don't have libraries but she had to explain to me why I never got to see a bookmobile because I'd heard about them and they were like legendary for me <laughs> they, they still exist they do, not. They do yeah. but not uh -huh. everywhere certainly not not mm -hmm. I think I hit him right at the height the late 70s very early 80s yeah. was the height yeah. of the bookmobile mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was always a big day though um, and I think I was the only kid to walk out of that bookmobile with those books. It was everyone else was like, "Oh, look, it's a book about soccer." You know, <laughs> zero yeah. interest on this side. Well, well, in our elementary school library, we had the uh, hardcover Universal Monsters picture books. So, like the Mummy. In fact, I actually have a couple of copies here. I have the Mummy, and I have Dracula's daughter. But I, I saw I even actually sixth grade. I had this book that said Blackula on it. I'm like, what is this black? Like, I didn't quite. I'm reading through it and seeing words like exploitation and black exploit, and I didn't really understand any of those words meant, obviously, in sixth grade. But those books were all there, and I read through all of them. Very cool. So, Yay. Nancy, did you have a. Did how I did you get. Childhood? You, yes. Well, well, did you have a childhood? <laughs> um, well, you've had several, is my understanding. Um, <laughs> um, uh, what. Did you have a, a book for or or a local library that was instrumental for you? Um, well, I was I'm from Philadelphia originally. I live in Canada now, but uh, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia. When I was a child, uh, I used to uh, I used to love to watch the Bronx movies. Of course, I watched the Bronx movies when I was very young, but managed to get there at some point. I remember the school took us to the the very large library downtown it's a kind of a faux something building renaissance building whatever but uh yeah it was a beautiful building and it was big just giant place and we went in there and uh you know i guess i was probably seven or eight that. and um they taught us the dewey decimal system <laughs> which of course i don't think anybody's using anymore uh and so we got to pick out a book and it's not that i hadn't read books before, I had, but people read books to me as well when i was very young but this was like me picking out a book myself, you know, from a library. It's a really big deal. So I found this book. It was called The Little Witch. <laughs> so I took that out of the library and uh, just fell in love with the book. 
and I had no idea about this book at all. Like I just, I just remember loving it. And I guess it was probably about 15 years ago or so. I just had this idea. I wonder if I could find that book. So I went onto the internet and did all the searches that you do to find things on the drive yourself crazy for days looking for things. And I finally found this book and it turned out, I bought a copy and it had been, I had no idea this book was so famous. It had been reprinted so many times. It was like a bestseller for 40 years. And it was by a librarian who worked in New England. Uh, and it's the only novel that she wrote. Uh, she wrote, also wrote some poetry. And uh, she just uh, wrote this great book. And children all over were reading this and relating to it. And I thought I was the only one, you know, I found this book in the library. Yeah, so I got a copy, and there were so many different editions of it, and they all had different covers, of course. So I had to search even more to find the one that was the one that I remembered. So, yeah, that's kind of my um, highlight, I suppose, of my childhood in terms of reading, you know, and getting into books that were in the field that I was interested in eventually as I got older. So the genre, exp the genre explores a lot more than just fear. Um, it, a lot of different emotions are actually explored despite its reputation as being pretty simple. Uh, is there a specific emotion or a specific uh, kind of horror story that you find yourself more drawn to both writing and reading? And let's start with Am Armand. I think, I, you know, growing up, I was a huge horror movie fan as well. So, you know, you watched, you know, I grew up like, like you did, uh, Lauren. I, I mean, you're probably way older than me. But, um, you know, I grew up on... I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I grew up on Halloween, and I grew up on Friday the 13th, and I grew up on... I mean, we would go to the, you know, the local video store before there was Blockbuster. We'd, we'd, me and my buddy, every Friday night, we would get dropped off, and we'd get, like, blood-sucking freaks and, you know, faces of death and all those, and you'd eat a pizza while you're watching these really awful, awful movies. And... Uh, as I got older, I started, I, I kind of got away from that. As we started getting into some really, you know, crazy over the top slasher horror and stuff. And for me, once I started writing it by that point, and, and you know, especially in my 20s, I really started noticing that I was writing more, I guess, what you would call quiet horror. You know, it, it wasn't about the slasher, it wasn't about the serial killer, it wasn't about that. It was, it was really. Uh, and of course, in my twenties, I couldn't really write as well as I wanted to, and you know, it, it's still the still the challenge. You're always still learning. But for me, it's more about more of what's in the character's head than necessarily the the guy with a you know bloody axe stalking you through through the house. Um, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a real big fan of um, you know really just the quiet stuff, and then and movies too. It's funny because. Whenever I do interviews, and they're like, "Oh, what's your, you know, what's, you know," they start naming horror movies from like the last, say, twenty years, and I'm like, "I, I haven't seen any of them." Like, I literally haven't watched. I would rather, um, when me and my wife started dating, you know, the first thing she said was, I, "I can't watch horror movies," and I said, "Good." I said, "I'd rather watch a Jennifer Aniston romantic comedy," and she thought that was hysterical. But I would rather watch a comedy or an action movie or something else rather than, um, you know, something that. You know the Saw movies or Hostel or Human Centipede. None of those interest me. You know none of none of those. My son uh, sat there. He's like one time when he was uh, in his teens. He's like, we gotta watch The Purge, and I'm like, I don't know what that is. And I like, halfway through, I was like, I'm bored. You know, I, I, I I'm not really I'm not really invested in this, and I'm not really into this. And I'm uh, I know you love it. When I was your age, I loved this stuff, but uh, you know now it's it's like just completely different for me. So definitely. The, the quiet stuff, the stuff that makes you think, um, you know, those types of, those types of, of, is what I write. It's, it's what I read too. I mean, I, I love a good, I mean, I, I still love a good monster book. You put a, you put a giant monster in, you know, in a shot on the water with some dude in a scuba gear about to get eaten. I'm, I'm at a, you know, severed press book. I'm going to read that thing uh, a thousand times. I love those, but it's, you know, that's about it. So I've babbled enough. Kristen. Yes. Um, is, there, is there a specific type of uh, story or a specific emotion inside the genre that you find yourself drawn to? Well, for me, 
what I'm the most interested in, I think, is, you know, the the ideas that are kind of like, I guess, kind of the cosmic horror in a way, or the things that, you know, what is really outside of our knowledge or our understanding. Um, you know, I'm not as, I mean, I do like, you know, some of the good slashers, like, you know, Halloween, you know, I'll enjoy watching that. But I, I'm really into like, um, I love like the lighthouse where, you know, it's that psychological um, idea, you know, of madness, what's going on. Um, I just really like the idea of, you know, what are these forces out there that we don't understand, that we can't comprehend, or even, you know, something like The Exorcist, which um, at one point I would have thought was a documentary, but um, <laughs> the idea that, you know, what what is what are these forces that are out there and that are beyond us, and will it, you know, it was some of those more like Lovecraftian ideas of things that will actually drive you mad, like that your mind can't process the knowledge, um, or like in the mouth of madness, um, John Carpenter, those kind of ideas I think are, are really, um, are really fascinating. So I, I'm always drawn to that. And I am drawn to like religious horror too. Um, and just like the way that that's, that's been explored, but I'm, I'm always, I, I, again, like someone mentioned, you know, the weird and, you know, the uncanny, that's something that I'm really drawn to because it's not something you see every day. You know, I, I want to think about things that, you know, kind of take me out of my own head and into something that's completely new, but yeah, universal because we all have these fears and we all ask these questions. Steve. Uh, yeah, the, when I first started writing seriously, the writers I was reading at the time were the hot contemporary literary writers at the time. People like uh, Barth and Bartholomew and Richard Brodigan and Mores. A lot of writers whose last name started with B. Um, also, like people like Italo Calvino. And those were the writers that really interested me. I was interested in language and in subtleties and subtleties of emotion. And I was still looking for the kind of literature I wanted to write, and I picked up a volume of stories by Ramsey Campbell. And the subtleties in his work, and especially the way he brought interior realities out into the landscape, fascinated me and just really clicked with the kind of writing I wanted to do. So from Campbell, I kind of went backwards and discovered M.R. James and read as much of that as I could find in all of the early British school of ghost story writers. And uh, at one point I was in a in one of the incarnations of Weird Tales and there was a story by Robert Aikman in there in, in the same volume. I had never heard of him before. I read his story and it knocked me out. So I read everything by Aikman. So I think those were the influences that that kind of drove me forward into the kind of horror fiction I tend to write and that I love. Can we all just uh, take a moment to just acknowledge that Ramsey Campbell is a global treasure? Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I love Aikman stuff too, which is wonderful. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Nancy. <laughs> yes. I, I can't wait to see the broadcast so I can hear what Steve says. <laughs> I can't hear a word he's saying. Um, what was the question? Oh, yeah. Type of horror. Um, I think I'm drawn, in generally in life, I'm drawn to the psychological and the mythological aspect of things, uh, which doesn't mean that I don't like this girl horror. I do. It, it, as long as it's a sort of a combination, if it's just like a straight up, God saying this, having written, you know, Jason's story, but you know, yeah, just the whole idea. Two. Of straight <laughs> two. Okay, two, two. But you know, the whole idea of just uh, somebody comes in and slashes people, and yeah, it, it doesn't have a depth to it usually, you know. And it's it's always like you know the kids in the house or the woman alone and or something. It's just it's too predictable for me. I want something that's not predictable. I want to be surprised. I want to be engaged. I want to be um, just, uh, you know, I want to feel that there's something profound here. And I know that probably doesn't sound bad to any of you, but if I were to say that to somebody on the street and I said, I want to find the profound in horror, they think I was insane. 
but it, it's there. It's definitely there. That's what it's about to me, uh, because it's part of life. It's this darkness that doesn't get uh, expression very often. People shy away from it. So I want to find what is in that darkness, you know, and it's uh, it's just a, a kind of a quest in a way, like a personal quest to, to feel what there is that's bigger than the daylight world, what is in the nighttime world, what is in the dark realm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the horror genre is all about mortality and morality at the end of the day, and they're both uncomfortable subjects. So those who tread there, you know, don't tread lightly. Gwendolyn. You know, for me, I think when you say, you know, what emotion does horror, you know, evoke for me or what do I think of? I always think of just the word dread and specifically like existential dread, just the horror of of living the horror of being human. And like Nancy was saying, a lot of stories and a lot of other genres don't necessarily get at that that much. Horror really looks at that. It, it doesn't kind of like flinch or turn away from how hard it can be to just be a human being, just to live in the world. And, you know, I think especially over the past year, I feel like everybody kind of like realized that a lot more whereas i think a lot of people that i know who are horror writers are kind of like yeah it's it's hard it's really hard just living and being alive and to me that's something that horror is, oh, i've always found very appealing about it is that it deals with that you know and probably out of types of horror i i've i've always gravitated towards body horror because i think it gets at that it gets at this idea of being in a human body is terrifying and it's actually really scary because even though you know you've got a mind and everything your body can do whatever it wants and it can take over or it can have changes and to have those kind of manifested even in monstrous ways kind of expresses how we all sort of feel sometimes, or at least I think a lot of horror writers and horror readers feel sometimes. It, it's very scary being a human being. And I do think that horror really gets at that and gets at that dread of just being in the world. And I liked what Kristen said about cosmic horror, because I think those two things are kind of similar, even though cosmic horror is so much bigger, at the same time, it, it is this idea of just the dread of, of, of living and the dread of being in this, in this universe for, for whatever that you know, whatever that means, I guess. <laughs> yeah, especially when you get into Lovecraft, where the cosmic mm -hmm. horror is his realm, really. He's like the originator of that in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that is a very scary realm because it puts us up against the idea of God. What is mm -hmm. God? And people mm -hmm. usually ask that question. Well, sometimes people don't, but some people do ask that question. What is God? And what is this about? How am I here? Why am I here? Where am I going afterwards? If there is an afterwards, mm -hmm. all of those big existential mm -hmm. questions, mm -hmm. but we don't mm -hmm. know. And Lovecraft yeah. was so amazing. And you probably, you know, know all about him, right? Everybody knows about Lovecraft and how yeah. he created this, this realm of, um, of beings and not even beings, but they just don't care about us. They just yeah. don't care about us. You know, we're down here and we think, oh, they love us. They hate us. They're trying to torture us. None of the above. They just don't care about us. So <laughs> that's probably the most horrific thing to really face that we're not mm -hmm. special. We're not, mm -hmm. you know, no one's looking down on us and, and mm -hmm. manipulating us like a marionette. It's none of the above. Yeah. We are alone. We come in alone, we leave alone, and we live mm -hmm. life basically alone, which doesn't mean mm -hmm. we don't have, you know, make efforts to be in contact with people and commune with people and make connections. But it is a very lonely existence, and the cosmic yes. car is, is quite, it hits that nail right on the head. Mm -hmm. really does. It's a scary idea that someone else might be the chosen one, but it isn't us. <laughs> Kevin. Um, as a reader, I really like what Nancy said about, uh, you know, searching for the profound, you know, when I, when I want to read horror, you know, when I'm picking up a, a Peter Straub novel or a Ramsey Campbell novel, um, you know, or Robert Aikman, or I'm also reading a book right now, uh, called the book of days, uh, by, by Steve actually, you know, I mean, these are, uh, as far as a reader, you know, that's what I'm really looking for when I'm reading horror. Um, as far as a writer, um, I, for me, I found my way, I, I need to find a personal angle when I'm writing my stories. Like, it's got to mean something to me. I, I remember early on, a lot of my early stories, I was trying to copy Lovecraft. I was trying to copy Bradbury. I was trying to write my own Stephen King novel. You know, and I remember um, 
I went to Borderlands Boot Camp two years in a row, and, and Mort Castle was one of my instructors. And I remember emailing Mort and I were emailing back and forth about stories and things like that, and about my writing in particular. And he gave me like the best quote, and I always use this quote all the time. And Mort told me his quote was, "The best stories, the ones that last, come out of the late night questions we ask ourselves." And for me, that's always been like, you know, when I'm writing a horror story, I, I can never get like, I know when I'm like, oh, this is a Kevin Lucia story. I really can't tear, can't guarantee it's going to be scary for anyone else. That's kind of the thing I that kind of find. I, I don't know if anyone else is going to find this scary, but this story is about some fear I have or something that, that makes me uneasy or I don't, or this makes me uncomfortable. So I'm going to write about it. And as far as movies go, Armand. I've really developed a taste for trash. Absolutely. If it's a movie, it's just, I, I'm especially 80s and 90s, low budget trash. I, I want it all, basically. So, <laughs> I find myself always looking for the uncanny. That's really the word I use. I like when something creeps up on me that's been in the text the whole time, but there's just a shocking moment when it's the context is revealed to be completely opposite of my expectations. And you realize there's something just profoundly wrong at that moment. That's the strongest reaction I have to in horror as a reader. And it's what I always strive as a writer to try and do. It's that moment that works for me. I like slow burns in a lot in both cinema and in if fiction, um, um, although I love the entire genre. I'm, I'm a big horror. I love it all. The truth is the strongest reactions and the most profound reactions I've ever had is those moments. When it, Peter Straub does it very well in a lot of his early novels, where it's, it's just a moment where the seemingly normal or at least um, normal for the horror genre moment is subverted just that touch more. And you suddenly don't feel like you're walking on solid ground anymore and that's the moment for me that's that's the moment it's the moment when the roller coaster goes over the hill where you step out of the plane to skydive which i would never do so gwendolyn you mentioned writing in the age of the pandemic do you guys think that this is going to fundamentally change the canvas that we're working on the last 14 months or whatever it is do you think it's um something that everyone that's alive and writing today is going to have to in some way address. Uh, let's start. Uh, we'll start with Gwendolyn since she introduced the subject and we'll work around. <laughs> you know, I think especially if we are anybody who's writing something that's somewhat modern, like if you are setting something in modern day, you know, I think you're going to have to probably address it to some extent. I feel like obviously if you write historical horror, if you write horror that you don't necessarily say what the time period is, you might be able to get, get away with not overtly addressing it. But at the same time, I feel like the last 14 months have left scars on all of us for all different reasons. I mean, some of us, you know, have lost jobs, lost family, you know, really, really specifically horrific things. And then others, it's just the loneliness of it. It's just, again, that existential dread. And so I think those things, whether we are conscious of them or not, will probably get in there in some way. I don't know that we can completely avoid that. I don't know, maybe there's some people out there that haven't been that affected by it. I imagine a lot of horror writers, even while we probably, like I was saying, I think we're kind of like, yeah, of course this is how it is. I still think we tend to be very sensitive. That's the thing I've noticed. Like I'm a very sensitive person. I thought maybe it's just me, but as I've met other horror writers, I think we tend to be kind of sensitive. Maybe, you know, writers in general are. And so I do think that in some ways we've probably all been affected by this and probably fairly profoundly. So however that has affected us, I think will come across in our work, even if we're not consciously saying, yes, I'm going to write a pandemic novel. We're probably going to get a lot of those too. I imagine there's going to be a lot of pandemic stories and like, I don't know. I'm not sure how many of those will be all that good, but I'm sure there's going to be some that are going to be great. So, you know, if somebody out there is writing a pandemic story, you, you do you, whatever, whatever makes your heart happy. But I, I do have a feeling we're going to get a lot. And I think we'll probably get a lot of fatigue from that in the next year or two, but who knows? <laughs> Kristen, what do you say? You know, that's an, it's an interesting question. And it's something too, that I especially wonder as far as like the younger generation of writers coming up, how it's going to influence them. Um, my daughter is almost 13 
And I would say that the pandemic hit her harder than any of the rest of us in my family because she she wanted to go to school and she wanted to be around her friends. And I think, you know, she had to deal with the concept of mortality at such a young age. And I guess the concept, even the ideas of like, you know, leaving your house, are you in danger or, you know, just like the paraphernalia, like the mask and the hand sanitizer. I mean, that's all, you know, making an impact, you know, in these formative years. And so I think that even for those of us who maybe um, were already aware of some of these things or we wrestled with these issues, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me, the younger writers coming up are going to probably see it in a different light. Excuse me. Steve. Um, well, I think it's still a little, a little early to tell. Um, in some ways, I think it's passing a little bit faster than I thought it would. Uh, it depends on how these various mutations, what they do to us. I know some people have told me they intend to wear masks for the rest of their lives. And I think some people's habits will change to stay mostly at home, but they may not live like they used to. Uh, certainly, it's culturally, it's revived podcasts. It has certainly put a charge into streaming. And I think that's that's something that we're not going to go, we're not going to turn away from. I think online activities will increase from this point in a way that they hadn't before. Um, so there's that cultural change. In terms of uh, this, how it's affected me, I'm already a fairly shy person. At this point in my life, I live by myself. So this last year was rather strange. I think it would kind of deepen any of my uh, hermit-like tendencies. And I'm right now I'm trying to struggle to get back out there again and to see old friends. But a lot of my old friends are my age and are still hesitant and are still nervous about getting out there. I'm still planning to go back to the movies maybe next month when A Quiet Place Part 2 comes out. That, that at least that's my plan. I'm going to take my daughter to it. But in terms of writing, I'll just have to see. I, I, I think it's going to, we'll see a lot more inward narratives, but we were already, already seeing a lot of inward narratives. Armand. Um, so it's funny because, I, you know, when this started, I immediately went, oh, we're going to see 5 million people writing all these pandemic books. And I remember, right, I, I can remember about a week or so before everything shut down, I was reading uh, uh, Tremblay's Survivor Song. I, I was reading in advance of that, and I was like, this is great. And then it's kind of happening, <laughs> and it was it, it, it kind of freaks you out of, no, these things would never happen, and and a lot of that stuff happened even worse than you than you thought it was. Um, me and Jay Wilburn uh, co-wrote a bunch of books together, and one of the books we wrote, uh, which came out recently, is Room One Thirty Eight, and it's a time travel book. So they go to all different places, like all different times, and we when we the book was already almost finished, and uh, Jay said, you know, we have to address this. I think if we're into 20 you know we have a, we actually have a chapter set in 2020 and i said i don't i don't want to i don't want to touch it like i i just for me i'm like i i'm not ready to write about what's going on right now and jay actually just kind of you know it's, it's a it's a small rewrite basically people with masks they had nothing to do with the chapter but it was one of those things where for me as a writer i i didn't want to address it. i didn't want to touch it and i'm still there i mean I still haven't read a lot of, you know, COVID fiction yet. I know it's out there. I know people are, are out there. But, you know, it's one of those. It, for me, it's kind of like 9-11. I was already in Florida then, but I grew up in New Jersey. I didn't want to watch TV movies about 9-11 the year after. I didn't want to read the books. I didn't want to read the articles. I, I lost friends. I lost people that I grew up with in, in, in the attack. I didn't want that, and it's still it's still one of those weird things, uh, parts of history that affected me. You know, my dad went to Vietnam. I still don't like to watch Vietnam movies or or anything. I mean, I was born in 1969. I mean, I was born, and he was still he was still out there fighting. So for me, it, it's kind of if it's personal, 
you know, it, 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 I step away from it. And I think I step away from it in my writing as well um, with, with those types of things too. So, but I know we're going to have, I know eventually we're going to have a lot of it. And I know like, it's going to be a normal thing. It's going to be, especially if this goes on, like, you know, like Steve said, people, a lot of people are going to just be wearing their masks. It's like, the, that's it. It's where we're all just going to be, hopefully not everybody, but people are going to be safe and it's going to be the new normal. And I think it'll bleed into it. It's got to bleed into our fiction. I mean, cell phones have bled into it and, and the internet and technology has bled into our fiction. So either you're writing like, like, like when looks like you're writing stuff from 1986 time period or at some point you have to address this especially if you're here and now nancy uh yeah um i mean i can only relate it it's not the same of course but uh i have an old series from the nine early 90s and i wanted to revamp it and i realized i have to get cell phones in there because people would not be able to relate to it new readers that were younger readers they said why don't they pick up a cell phone and do something you know it doesn't make sense make a call uh so yeah I, I think it would be the same with this that people would if you're setting a story in now in this year obviously it has to and last year it has to relate to the pandemic or it doesn't make sense like if it's identified as the year maybe in the future it's who knows if we get back to any sort of normal normal or what but maybe it there's a point where it moves away from pandemic land and we're into something else in five years and that becomes relevant to new books i don't know I couldn't say. All I know is I've been working on a, a science fiction horror novel that's about a pandemic that's set in the future <laughs> for the last three years. So I hope there's room for it in the world that people don't turn away from it because of the pandemic. But what can you do? It's a different kind of pandemic. So anyway, <laughs> it's always here. this way, you know, you're, where you sort of you have a sometimes you're too ahead of the market ahead of the market or you're too behind the market it's just very hard to get something that's right there you know when because it takes a long time to write some novels not all but some novels take a long time i can see the book proposal now i swear i wrote this three started writing this three years ago <laughs> it's not what you think kevin um everything i've written since july i just kind of ignored the pandemic I, I just made the dates very general you know i just have you know just haven't you know really let it imp impact it too much i do have a, a novel that i've been writing for a while it's like one of those things where i'll finish a project then i go tool on a novel then go to a different project. So eventually that by the time that actually sees the light of day it'll be a couple of years after so i imagine i will end up referencing it in past tense i'm sure i'm going to have to work in things like vaccinations and i've already slightly mentioned like how it affected the small town during the quarantine but even that i thought of that will be done two or three years afterwards so i i will just reference it in past tense and and that's about the, the extent that i really really want to address it i guess I just i just don't have the inclination to write anything uh, pandemic related, I guess. I uh, allowed myself to write a short story just to get it out of my system so I'd never have to deal with it again. It's titled 19 and it's done. As far as I'm concerned, unless the world changes so fundamentally that that's the world we're writing stories in from now on. Um, I, I just, I, sh I think a short story was enough for me to get it out of my system. Um, I wanted to pivot a little bit Publishing in the age of the six by nine trade paperback uh, has some of the luster of writing, or at least publishing, fallen off for anyone. Um, now that the the model has changed so much, uh, I mean, obviously the days of uh, hardcover book club editions and um, even even multiple chain bookstores is all rearview mirror now. The market's definitely changed. Has your passion for it changed not necessarily lessened but has it changed let's uh start with kevin and we'll go backwards um i think no for me because i've uh taken my first uh stumbling steps in the midst of all of this transition you know i i sold my first short story um 
back in like 2007. So from then onward was the introduction of ebooks and Kindle and Nook and, and this and that. And we heard the cry that physical books were going away and no, they're not going away. So I think it's been nothing but transition since I started. So for me, there was no, I mean, obviously I had an idealized view of what being a writer was going to be when I was a kid. And I got a very, I got a very late, I got a later start. Um, but since I've been in the middle of it, it's been in flux, you know, uh, from, from the word go. So, I mean, I guess at the very least it, it's made it simpler. I, I write because I want to, I write because I have to, I write because there's no way I could stop myself from writing. So, uh, if I didn't write, I'd go crazy. Uh, as far as where it's going to get published, um, that seems to change, uh, on a week to week basis, but it's been that way since I first sold my first short story. So I, I really haven't known anything, any, anything else. So Nancy. Uh, I don't think the change in format has bothered me much. I mean, you know, in terms of eBooks and, and hard covers and trade paperbacks and all of that, you know, that's not it so much. It's more, uh, and writing, I'm a writer. That's what I do. So, and edit, <laughs> but I, you know, this is not that aspect of it it's the aspect of it is the the massive amount of books that are out there and the way books are purchased now um and and that has a lot to do with um books that are ordered from amazon you have to know the title that you're looking for usually when you go to amazon to get a book it's not the same as being in a bookstore bookstores are becoming almost like museums now because there's so few of them left uh or at least i think so I'm not talking about the chain bookstores. I'm talking about the, like the, the the little bookstores that you know where you'd go in and the person you knew the person and the, the, the nice wooden shelves and all that. Um, yeah, so that that's changed a lot. And how to get published, how to get a book published is um, I'm at a loss. I you know I admit it. I, I think most of the people I know are at a loss. There's no way to know what to do. There's no easy route to to. I can't say publishing has ever been easy, but there was at least a defined road that you were on. There was a route to get from here to there. Um, and that's not true anymore. So I don't think most people really know anything much about, unless you're 20, if you are speak up, you know, because you know more than I do about this. I don't know what's going on today. I'm just writing and um, hoping, you know, for the best. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I, I don't really understand how to move forward unless you are like a super, super uh superstar marketer and you can get on to amazon i suppose people do that when they self-publish and you know buy ads and get yourself noticed in that way and push and get to be number one on the amazon list of ebooks that were given away that week i don't know that that's kind of like a it's not it doesn't strike me as a career the way career used to mean the word had a meaning before, but I don't know what it means now. I'm not sure if everybody's in this for a career or it's just a hobby or some excitement of the moment. I don't know. I really don't. So I'll just stop talking because I don't know. Steve. Well, I'm very much attached to the printed book. And when I grew up and wanted to first become a writer, what I wanted was to be in those books on the shelves. And there was the time when uh, both Amazing and Fantastic Magazine were being published by a fairly marginal publisher and the pages were yellow and the pages were often miscut and the art was placed badly and I absolutely loved it. I wanted to be in that magazine. And, so, and I've always been attached to print publication because of those early experiences. So when eBooks came around, I wasn't very excited. I I have a, an ebook reader and I, I like it for the fact that I can have a lot of books on it that I don't want to invest in in terms of the space for a printed copy. And so I, I read a lot of things in ebooks. But as far as being in a publication, I find I feel almost nothing when something comes out electronically. And this is even though I have lots of books out electronically through uh, Crossroad Press. Melly's books are out through Crossroad Press. And we make money from it. I make money from it every month. So I like that part of it. But as far as being published electronically, I feel next to nothing. It's just 
it's a source of income. That's about it. So I think that's been the biggest change for me in publishing. And sometimes I will uh, go for being published in a magazine, a print magazine, or an anthology, even though an online publication may pay more, just because I want to have that physical object in my hands. Armand. You know, it's it's funny as a as a teenager, you know, writing all these awful theme tunes rip off things. I uh, I would go into the little mom and pop bookstores or you know uh, Walden Books in the mall or any of those, and I would go to they used to all have horror sections, and I can remember going and finding the R section and going, my books will be right here between this author and this author, and and like that visual of this is where I want to be. And once I started publishing, you know, 2007, 2008, and all those, I embraced the ebook part, but I'm, I'm like Steve, I'm still a fan of the print books. I mean, I still have shelves and shelves of books behind me. And I, I have, you know, 200 releases in, in ebook, which is great. It's exciting. But when you get that print copy in your hand, you just, you can't compare. Right behind me is, I finally, a bucket list was doing a book for Thunderstorm, doing a, a, a limited release. And I was like a little kid. I mean, my wife was laughing at me. I was like a little kid when I opened that box and I saw a copy of it. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever to have a 29 print run book that I wrote. And that was more exciting than, than really anything. So as much as people talk about the death of print books and all that, I, I think that we're always going to have them. Um, for me, I've had to embrace audiobooks because with the pandemic, my audiobook sales have gone through the roof. Um, and it's crazy because I don't listen to audiobooks. I can't listen for more than five or ten minutes. I, I, my mind wanders, and my wife swears by it, and that's all she listens to now is audiobooks. And for me, I can't do it. But it's great having that, you know, like Steve says, it's great having that paycheck every month. It's great when uh, when, when they, they, they pay you that big chunk of money every month for it. But if, if all things were equal and, and you say, well, you can make you can make money, ebook, audiobook, print book, all three, which would you rather have? I would rather do the I would rather do the print book. And that's just as an old guy, as the personal, uh, you know, I, I, I like that book behind it because, yeah, my my um, my Kindle reader has 3000 books on it right now. But for me, I would rather look look behind me and grab it and pull a book off that shelf. And read it. I, I only read really my Kindle at night when I'm laying down, and but otherwise I, I want a print book. You know, I want to go to the library still, and I still want to pull that new book out. So, for me, I think that's uh, you know it, it's a change. Who knows what the next big thing will be? You know, we're we're gonna uh, download books directly into our microchips. Who knows? But whatever whatever it is, I'll embrace it as a as a uh, as a publisher, as a self publisher, or working with with small prints or, or, uh, or some of the bigger presses, but, um, you know, you, you just kind of roll with it. It's, it's still, it's still the career, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do this full time because I've embraced all of these different formats and different things, uh, for it. Kristen. Um, well, I am, uh, really new on the scene. So I am, very excited to be included in any capacity. Um, I am just really excited that anybody is reading anything that I'm writing and it's fun to just get to interact with people and and something like this is just such an honor to me to even be involved. Um, but I, I have to agree, I, I have had some things printed online, um, but I was also in, um, my first print publication was um, the issue of Black Telephone Magazine, which just came out um, from Clash Books. And I was in their uh, winter issue and, and when it came and, uh, you know, I saw my name in print and, and I, I held it in a magazine and, you know, I was just blown away. I was so excited because I've always, you know, I love short stories and it was always my goal to be in a magazine. So it was very exciting that I got to see a, a print copy and and then I'm fortunate. I've been really fortunate that I get to be in some um, anthologies coming out that are, um, you know, books. And I'm excited to um, 
be involved in that. And it's, I think to me, it's really exciting too, like the independent publishing scene that's going on right now and the small presses. And there's so many people that are doing so many cool things and so many new things and that, you know, are providing those opportunities to somebody like me who is, you know, just starting out and um, well, I'm not just starting out writing, but just starting out uh, finding an audience <laughs> finally. <laughs> And that kind of thing. And I just feel like it's a really, in some ways, it's a really cool time um, from that perspective because you have some more of those like non traditional avenues and, you know, you can, a way to find an, um, an audience there and to get some opportunities. So um, I'm, I've really been enjoying that, but it is still, it was very exciting to see it in front for the first time. And, you know, it's nothing like it. I, I never thought it would actually happen. So I'm still ex very excited. And Gwendolyn. You know, I mean, I've only been published for about seven years. I think it was 2014 when, when my first short story was published. And then I wasn't even professionally published until like the next year. So only really six years as a sort of like, as they say, professional author. You know, I, I always say, am I really a professional author? Even now that's probably up for debate. But um, so, you know, a lot of the ebook, you know, that whole debate had already started by the time I came in. So, you know, I, I don't really have necessarily a huge amount of insight in, in that regard and in terms of how I feel about that as a writer. As a reader, I read a little bit on ebook, but I'm usually like like most of us here, you know, I don't read a ton. I'll I'll read some, you know, but it's usually like when I look and I'm like, I'm gonna get a book. I'm, I'm never like, oh, I'm really excited about this book. I can't wait to get it on my Kindle. I don't even have a Kindle. I just like have my laptop and like the Amazon thing. My husband has a Kindle. He doesn't mind it. You know, sometimes I think he's a little more adaptable than I am. I'm more kind of like curmudgeonly. I'm like, I like my book. Like, it's like I can hug it. I don't feel like I can hug a Kindle the same way I can hug a book. You know, so there's definitely there's definitely that that element. I, I do miss bookstores, especially now that I haven't been able to even go into even a chain bookstore, you know, in, in over a year, I guess, probably like a year and a half now, which is which is really, really sad. But I definitely do love paperbacks. But again, I understand the 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 allure of ebooks and even being published online. Because you know, the thing about it is I say, you know, I love having an anthology, but I've had stories come out in an anthology that the book looks great, everything's great, nobody reads it, nobody buys it. Then I'll have a story that'll come out and it's available for free to read online. And those are the ones I get the most feedback on. So it's like those are the ones that people are reading. So I'm always like you know, I personally love the paperback, but I understand that, you know, people don't always have the money. They don't always have the time to go and grab a book. Whereas if it's online, they might click a link and, you know, read something off an online magazine. So it's like, I definitely, I definitely appreciate that aspect of it. And I do think some of my short stories that have done the best, you know, and gotten the, the biggest audience have been published online. So that's why I'm never going to be like, oh, digital or online. No, because I'm like, oh, that would be, you know, not, not accurate for what sort of helped me overall in my career. And Armand, my parents pointed out, my dad, but both my parents, because they love horror so much, they're so excited that I'm a horror writer, pointed out that on the bookshelf, my last name, Keist, is between King and Koontz. My dad was very excited when he realized that and looked in like the Horror Writers Association directory, and he's like, you're right between them. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I've, I've told this story before, um, but the most beautiful thing in the world to me is, in my mind, is this copy of the stand that uh, my sister bought at a yard sale. And it, was, it had already been owned by probably six people before that. The, sp the spine had so many cracks in it, and it actually had a fall open point. You know, if you just drop the book, it'll always fall open to the same page. It was a well worn book, but she took it on vacation. And because my sister is my sister, she left it out in the rain one day. So if you've ever seen a book uh, paperback, and especially an old paperback, um, mass book, it, it blooms like a flower into a Rolodex that cannot be closed. So by the time the book was passed down to me, that's how I read it. I, I read it with the book trying to fall apart around me as it went. And it's amazing it held together. But you know what? I always think in my mind that that book is the most beautiful thing in the world because it was loved except when my sister left it out in the rain it by a lot of people. And to me, 
that's always been the goal. The goal has always been some ratty paperback that's been passed around by way too many people, has had too much, uh, you know, armpit sweat on its its creases because it, it was just thrust under an arm as they went out the door to go to the laundromat. That's, that was always the biggest goal for me. Um, and, and when I say paperback, I'm not talking about a trade paperback. I'm talking about, you know, the real mass market paperback, which today is a rarity. Um, I never thought that day would come. So I think it has changed for me. I don't think it's lessened necessarily. I'm still passionate about the idea of people being able to read anything I scribble on a piece of paper. That's awesome. But it definitely has changed and kind of like the crystalline image in my head from when I was a kid. That's definitely not something I can strive for anymore. You know, it, it definitely has changed fundamentally. But I have a story I could tell like that. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I got an, uh, well, this was a letter. It was so long ago from um, a guy who read one of my books and uh, he was young and he had, he hated reading. He absolutely hated reading. He never read a book when he was going to school and he had to, you know, know about a book. He would read the notes, you know, that you would buy Cole's notes. We called them up here and, uh, and just kind of give, get a general idea of what the book was. He really did not like the process. He was walking down the street one day and somebody was moving and they put a box boxes out on the street of things they were throwing away and there was my book on top of on the top of the box and it was one of it was the um well there were two book, two novels i had that came out kind of simultaneously but one of them was called near death and it was in my original series and that was the book that was sitting there on the top and for some reason he liked the cover i guess and he picked it up and he took it home and he read it and, and he told me it was the first book that he had actually read that was not forced upon him in school and it changed his life. And I'm, just, I'm reading this like, why did you mean to change your life? What he meant, what he was trying to say is that he now has read a lot of books because of that book that he liked so much and he got so immersed in the world. And that's what books are supposed to do for you, get immerse you into a world. Um, and he went on to then to read other books. And I, I was so touched by that because this is, uh, life-changing for a person, you know, and yeah, that's my good story. <laughs> that is a beautiful damn thing. <laughs> it really is. Guys, we just uh, transversed over the hour point, so I'm not going to tie up the rest of your evening, but I want to thank every one of you for coming on. It's awesome to hear all your stories and your perspectives. I think it's important we have these conversations as a community because too often, as the last 14 months has shown us, we can seem very much uh, like we're all being put in the corner, right? So in our best um, Patrick Swayze moment, we need to reach out to each other, pull each other out of the corner, and make sure we understand that uh, sometimes we have to show each other that we give a damn. So I want to thank all of you for coming on. If you have any final words, scream them out, and then uh, we'll catch you next time. Nothing. Just, thank you so much for having us. This was really fun. This was great to virtually meet everyone. <laughs> yeah, yes. thanks. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Hopefully it doesn't have to remain virtual forever. That'd be good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you soon. All right. <laughs>